You're on the thick screens Hello Network, earning the reputation of giving all the right ingredients, uninhibited in exposing the hard, cold facts about the Watchtower Society. And now, in Disney. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome in once again to a rockin' awesome night here at the Six Screens. Well, my name is Rick Farron. I'm at the control panel up in Boston, Massachusetts, and we do have coming on tonight Watchtower Insider Tells All. Of course, that's Barbara Anderson, and her guest tonight is Carrie Cade. And we're looking forward to both of them coming on, but I want to tell you this has been a big week in the Watchtower. This could be a history-changing week. We'll see. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have a lot to say about that. Maybe later on before Barbara and Carrie leave the program, we'll open up the lines and get some thoughts on the program and what you think took place this week. So let me bring Barbara on right now and uh, see what's happening in her world. And here she is. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Rick. I'm ready to, s to discuss all these Earth's changing things. Well, I, you know, I have to tell you, I am so pleased. You have a lot of energy. We have uh, 14 different programs now going here on the six screens. Oh. But I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking at a woman that is on the ball. I am certainly looking at a woman on the ball. Barbara, you, I want to tell you, I appreciate very much. You're always ready to go. You're right there. You do your homework. We, we love you here, Barbara. You're doing a great okay. job. Now That's tell us about the fun of my life doing research. I love uh, it. Well, you do love it. Now tell us what's going on tonight. Well, we've got Carrie Kay with us. So many of people who are here tonight are familiar with Carrie. She's got a Facebook page that um, is uh, popular. And uh, she is an individual who embraces freedom. I embrace freedom too, by the way. And I know you do, Rick. And we're going to talk about freedom uh, at, this evening. Excellent. Well, let's bring Carrie on, and I'll be here in the background if you need me. I know you have some clips uh, you wanted me to play, so just anything you want me to do as far as showing pictures, just let me know. Give me a heads up. I'll put it up for you, okay? Okay. So mm -hmm. let's bring a Carrie on right now. There she is. Mm -hmm. And uh, So, Carrie, are you coming in? Is it, where, where do you live, in California? Yes. I'm in California. Wow. Huh? Well, my goodness, it's only, well, let's see. What is it, about only 3 o'clock out there, I guess, huh? Yes, yeah. yes, 3 o'clock. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on Barbara's program. I'll step out of here. You guys can go at it. If you need me, I'm here. Okay. Well, I'm going to introduce you. Hey, hey, Carrie. Hi, how are you? Me? I'm ready to go. That's the name, uh, my other name, you know. I always have energy to talk to other people. Yes. And uh, they, um, we, our theme is embracing freedom. And when I became a witness, I'm going to do a little spiel here. When I was uh, 14 and became a witness, I thought that I was now, at that time, embracing freedom because mm -hmm. I thought that embracing freedom meant that I would know things that I didn't know and before, and I would be doing things that I would never have done before. So I thought I was free. And it was um, a thrill to me to be have this freedom that I thought hardly anybody had on the face of the earth. Only these people that were teaching me uh, the Bible. And um, so going to today or yesterday when we learned this uh, change in uh, the way that the wash hour uh, now looks at um, uh, dealing with disfellowship people. And, you know, I sent out announcements about what I was told and what I heard. And some, I said, uh, now, I said, now people can shake my hands because I'm disfellowshipped, but they can shake my hand. Mm -hmm. And somebody wrote me back and said, no, they can't because, why? Because I'm an apostate. 
So, <laughs> so you can shake my hand of them just fellowship, but don't combine the two, right? So yes. you're not free to shake my hand. And uh, are you disfellowship, Carrie? No, I am not. Oh, good. So feel free to shake hands with it. <laughs> so our lives, my life didn't change any. Um, now, my life uh, today didn't change any because of this new stuff. But um, you're going to talk uh, and tell us all about what embracing freedom means and to you as a child and as you grow older. So uh, your age, when your parents became witnesses, because in effect, it could almost be said that you were raised in it, but what was your age when they became witnesses? My mother started a study. Well, we were we introduced around the time we moved on to the we moved on to a new street. We moved, we moved homes. Um, and that was in 1973. I was in kindergarten. Um, okay. And so shortly after that, we met people across the street. You know, you start to get to know your neighbors. And um, as time went on, um, we started to get closer to these people across the street because they ran a board and care home. And my mom started to befriend them. And they started to talk to her. Uh, there was some of the anointed in the home, some people from Bethel. And so, of course, um, they wanted to tell my mom about the hope and um, the, their hope. And I had a little brother that passed away. So uh, having him die, the hope for the resurrection was something that appealed to her um, and appealed to our family. Um, so we had this hope that I would have a baby brother back. Um, so um, we became even more close. Um, my so mom you began. Know, you didn't know about the uh, witness uh, says before that, before you moved to the, the street? Basically, no. you didn't. Okay. No, no basically. So that's what you call neighbor love, right? They, <laughs> <laughs> they introduced to you uh, the witnesses who they said were the lovingest people around, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so my mom started to, to study with them. And soon we were attending the book study at the house. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun for me because at the end of the book study, uh, the, all the kids would be at the edge of their chairs. And when soon as the brother would say amen, they ran to the kitchen to a drawer and opened it up because there was candy. So that was kind of a surprise to see all the little children on the edge of their seat and then boom, to the kitchen. It was quite fun, actually. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Well, it was certainly uh, a draw to get the kids to want to even go <laughs> across the street or from the neighborhood to that home. Now, you met somebody at that home, and we're familiar with the name of the, uh, the person, but you didn't meet the person, you met a relative. T tell us about the um, uh, somebody who was in that home that was closely related, related to uh, the uh, number one man in the organization. There was um, an older woman in the home and her, her daughter used to come visit. She played piano at our hall. So she would show me the piano at the house and we would play the piano, but she was actually there to see her mother. And her sister was married to Brother Noor. So um, it was Brother Noor's mother-in-law that was in the home. And so I became very close with um, his sister-in-law and the family, adored them and we just we just had a ball with with that family. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So that's well, that's, that's kind of new light, isn't it, for us listeners uh, to uh, hear a little bit about his family. You know, we knew about his wife, but I never really thought about her mother. So her mother was in California in a. Would you have called that a nursing home? It was more like a board and care. 
And so he had a variety of different patients there. Some were from Bethel, um, had some had mental illness, schizophrenia. Um, some he also brought in other people from the from the from the various hospitals that were in the area. So some some of the patients weren't weren't Jehovah's Witnesses, but the majority of them that were in the home were. Um, and I know that there were a couple who were of the anointed. And um, so that term I learned about very, very early. I see. Yes. They, uh, um, how many uh, uh, people did they generally have at that house? That not not counting the owner, but I mean, patients, so if you want to oh. call them. Um, people. We call them the old people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, the kids on the street, we all, the, the, the old people, um, <laughs> probably anywhere between six to eight. And oh. then they had a, a, then they had a second house. And so they were, they would, they would bounce them back and forth. And, and, uh, and one of the, one of them really loved to go out in field service. And if he didn't take his medication, it was, it was difficult <laughs> because he would start knocking on people's doors at five o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, <laughs> the neighbors didn't appreciate that too much, but we knew he was zealous. So I see. And that covered all, what well, covered all subjects. He was zealous. We all know what that meant, right? <laughs> so um, now when was your mom baptized? She was baptized in 1975 at Dodger Stadium. Oh, and that year, that mm -hmm. Pivotal year, oh, so mm -hmm. and, and I we camped in the car parking lot. I remember that, and I remember the snow comes. So. Oh yeah, that's right. That that's what brought the children in. It was the snow cones back then, and then they outlawed all the food. So then you know it wasn't attractive anymore. <laughs> uh, you have to go outside of the assembly and buy it. So. Uh, um, you got to meet relatives of some of the people that ran this organization at a time when I came in it, really. And uh, of course, 1975 was an important year, but I was already in it. But um, uh, you met um, someone else who I, uh, I knew at, at headquarters and it was a relative of his. And so tell us about him. Uh, first, before you tell him uh, anything more, I'm going to ask people to, to see, what do you know about a governing body member? He's, he's dead, but it was, he was part of the, our world till just not that many years ago, who had bushy eyebrows. That's what it's <laughs> for, bushy eyebrows. It was hard to talk to him and not watch those, all those, Hairs go different ways. <laughs> exactly. Fun of him. He was a very entertaining uh, mm -hmm. man. Uh, I remember when my husband gave a talk at his kingdom hall, and um, this governing body member was pretty old, and he slept through my husband's entire talk. So uh, that was, <laughs> that's my memory <laughs> of it. So let's, let's hear a little bit about him and his um, family. Well, he had a nickname um, because he roomed with the, the brother who um, who ran the home. And so I knew him as Slimy Limey. Slidey? So, slimy huh? Limey. Slimy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, who, are we, who are we talking about? Let's get it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Lyman Swingle. No. Many people listening tonight uh, probably uh, remember that name. Or remember him from speaking at assemblies years ago. That yeah. name, though, slimy. I don't know where that came from. Okay, continue. Continue with the story. <laughs> it kept it. It kept it interesting because when I knew his, I didn't obviously I didn't call him that, mm -hmm. but when I saw his eyebrows and I knew his nickname, but he didn't know that I knew his nickname. I couldn't help but kind of giggle inside and keep the laughter behind laughter in um but his his daughter had gotten married and and you know i'm telling the story from swingle's, a i believe swingle's daughter was his stepdaughter because he married a woman who already had a bunch of kids okay it, that could have been he, he was a very own uh you know so 
that she got married at the house across the street and my parents yeah. opened their home uh, for them to have the reception at my parents' house. So um, that's when I had more one-on-one -on -one contact with him and, and he made me laugh and he was a very nice brother and his wife was, was really sweet. Very, yes. very nice woman. That's right. He kind of identified with the families outside since he married a woman with children and they were a little older uh, when they got married, but uh, he, he really adored the, the family from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, he always had a great uh, sense of humor. You're right. Uh, so um, uh, how did you get along with uh, these people? Tell, tell us about your uh, personality at this time. Now you were what? Uh, seven, eight, Yes, yeah, seven or eight. Um, I adored them um, mm -hmm. with all their quirks and everything. I had to live with them day, you know, day in and day out. Um, I, I actually met them when I was riding my bicycle and I wanted to ride down their driveway because it would have been fun um, because there was a hill that went down. So one day I decided to ride my bike down there and I did. And the dogs started to chase me. They had dogs in the backyard and I didn't know where to go. I dropped my bike and I ran to the back door. The back door was locked. So then I went to the other door and opened that door and I flew in, fell on the ground, slammed the door and all the old people looked at me. <laughs> That's how I <laughs> An invasion of the what? <laughs> <laughs> I remember my hands were my hands were all scraped up, and um, the oh. owner he 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 took me to the sink and he washed my hands. But and they all came over, and from that moment on, I just I just you know would go over when they were having dinner or yes. um, at times we would babysit. My my mother would babysit. Um, we went camping. We went up to the forest. Um, we went to the beach sometimes if one of the men was having an episode and he was schizophrenic we would take him to the pacific ocean and dump him in so that he would wake up I see. and come out of it and it was... so yeah so i would travel with them back and forth so i basically helped take care for them and um so i just shuffled along and um was just like kind of like behind them like a little waddling duck wow. <laughs> Was but the, it was, was like a family, there. extension of your family. It what was. a nice way to ha have a childhood, isn't it? It was. Yeah. It was and he was like he was like a second father because my dad didn't come into the organization for a while, so he was kind of what we what I like looked at as my spiritual father, <laughs> in a sense. And then he started to take um, take me to the assemblies in early in the morning. And I don't know if I'm getting too far ahead here. No, um, no, no. Mm -mm. And I worked in the kitchen at a very young age at the Where assembly from Hills. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I remember I, uh, the kids could uh, work because you you all were uh, um, had a lot of energy and you would run and get things for those that worked in the kitchen. Um, yeah. I would yeah. walk that circle, the, the yeah. assembly walk, walk the circle, walk the circle. I was like, oh, let's get her up early in the morning. She can crack eggs. <laughs> so I did, and I you enjoyed have, it. You have uh, uh, good memories. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you thought you were free. Yes, didn't you? yes, yes. You thought you had the greatest freedom, and all the kids around didn't have what you had. That's the way I felt when I converted to the witnesses. Somebody you met besides Swingle, and uh, t I want everybody to hear about this because I sure. Uh, had some a little experience, not much, with the individual. But uh, you, um, there was just one year, and I, I think you were a little older, right? Uh, that you met someone. The name is familiar to everybody. Yes. Um, should I drop the name first or tell the story? Yeah. Tell the story. Okay. I saw a commotion inside the main hall. And there was a very well, you know, obviously everybody's well-dressed. There was a young gentleman there and everybody was surrounding him where he couldn't move. He couldn't, he couldn't get out of the way. And um, I noticed it. And then I see 
my spiritual father, he comes in, taps me on the shoulder. We have a job for you. Like, okay, come to the cafeteria. So I went back to the cafeteria and they brought this young man in and sat him down. And he says, watch the doors, make sure nobody comes in and make sure he has anything he wants as far as what you want anything to eat or to drink, coffee, tea, water. And so I did. It was Michael Jackson. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I spent, the, I spent the afternoon with him. And um, I didn't realize who it was. But, but I is, it, it special because I didn't have to go sit in the hall. <laughs> I was oh. playing those. <laughs> so, so what was your impressions? Now, he, your kid and uh, your, your adult sitting, I guess. So what was your impression of the man? He was very kind very, very mild spirit, very kind. And um, he just was just like a gentle soul is how I would describe him. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what so I, many have said about him. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Now uh, you're an energetic kid uh, in a lot of ways, but how energetic were you about the ministry? All right. I joined the school as mm -hmm. soon as I could. Mm -hmm. um, and I went out in field service uh, as soon as I could. I actually went by myself. I walked to the field minister to the field, uh, meeting for field service because it was right around the corner. Um, I joined the school. My first talk was with a pioneer sister. Um, it was quite interesting because the subject was um, concerning 1975 and how we were supposed to rely on Jehovah. And I prepared the talk, I wrote the talk, we studied the talk and she made me angry at the end of it because she changed it <laughs> at the end <laughs> of the talk um, because I worked so hard and I thought, well, I wrote the talk, why are you changing your script? <laughs> so wow. I, was, um, I enjoyed the theocratic ministry school, um, I got, I. I enjoyed the research. Um, I enjoyed the writing. Um, my you were heart a participator, weren't you? Pardon? You were a participator. You just wouldn't yeah. sit on the sidelines like some children do. Right. Yeah. I enjoy, and I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed going out in field service with the sisters, um, the Pioneer sisters, and we had, a, we had a blast. We had a good time. So. See all those memories that you still have because they were so pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. And but not all the witness kids have pleasant memories. And we know that because we hear of their experiences. So you were very, mm -hmm. very fortunate. And so uh, what developed when you were in high school? In you, high school, you, I, started, you started to do something. I started to do auxiliary pioneer on and off, you know, on those special months. So um, I really, I really dived into it. Um, because a lot of the, my friends were doing that as well. So we, so we did it together. Um, and we had a good time. Um, yeah. We had a good time with that. Well, even the older folk who pioneered together or exhilarated pioneered together have a good time. Usually they uh, walk, walk the streets between the uh, houses and, and laugh and cut up. And uh, it's yeah. an enjoyable uh, uh, time. We have good memories from that. If you're working alongside of somebody who is of a like personality, uh, mm -hmm. not a grump, and so it, uh, uh, these memories are as real to you today and as mine are to me. So uh, there, as you got a, a little older, uh, you have a memory about somebody who I have heard of, but I never met. And this man was at headquarters. But he wasn't there when I was there. He had left. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of the people that are listening tonight knew him because I, I see uh, the message from, on the side from somebody who tells us that they're listening. And they were there when this man was there. And so please tell us. Okay. Um, there was a brother and sister in our congregation where um, he, he was friends with. And so he would come. And, 
and visit. It was Reinhardt Langtech. And mm -hmm. he would come visit our hall. He would come and do go out in field service with us. And he was really, really a nice man. Um, About I, 1985, wasn't it? Yes. And um, he had moved to Tacoma, Washington. And there was something going on. But, you know, being young, I was I, at this time, I was probably about 14, 14 ish. Um, but I had heard that there was some something going on. Um, but, you know, they were always closed mouth about it. But through the grapevine and overhearing, there were some heated conversations between him and his friend <laughs> that he would stay with. Is that right? So yes. he would come over from Washington State and uh, stay with his friends. Mm -hmm. And they were former Bethelites, too, right? Yes. yes. And so uh, uh, for those who don't know who uh, this man knew and associated with closely, uh, you, you can elaborate on that because um, his friend is somebody we all knew. Cal, Cal and Etta? No, no. Reinhardt. Ray Franz. Ray, pardon? Ray Franz. He was friends with Ray Franz. Yeah, very yes. close. Ray Franz. Yeah. Very close. Very close. Did you yes. ever speak to Ray Franz? <sighs> Not to me. Not to me. But that could be what the heated conversations were about. That's probably what they were talking about. Yes. So yeah. uh, Ray Franz in 1980 was. Uh, on some ceremonia, <laughs> left Bethel. Uh, this fellow you're talking about, he left also, but not, uh, he left on, on his uh, own, um, he didn't, he wasn't put out, but he was a very close friend. He worked on the aid book uh, under uh, Ray. Yes. And um, he was a great writer. In fact, uh, from what I have heard, by people who knew know him or knew him, I think he's still around. So uh, they know him from Washington State. And um, as I was told that even uh, when he was, even even though he was not happy with what happened uh, with the Ray Franz issue, he mm -hmm. was still in good standing, and mm -hmm. he was writing uh, Watchtower articles for the society. Uh, even afterwards from his home. I don't know how many years that continued, but he did, he did do that. One of the funny things is uh, the, the, a couple of people who, a married couple, they used to go to his house for the book study. And then afterwards they'd have something to eat and he liked to sing. So uh, they all sang uh, kingdom songs afterwards. And so one of them asked him, and, and this is early on when I, came out, uh, out. Uh, so this was oh, two, 2000 and um, probably 2004 and I was mm -hmm. uh, meeting people from all over the United States after I was on Dateline. Uh, someone asked uh, this guy, Ling, Ling Hart, um, if he wanted to meet me and uh, you know what he said? He said no. <laughs> so, so I missed out you know, because I would have asked him a lot of questions and, and he knew that, you know, so. We did, we did go visit him uh, when, uh, when I was 15, yeah, 15. And we went to, um, we went to the Tacoma Dome and we went to the assembly and my brother and I stayed with Reinhardt Langtet. And I remember him his house being very very modest and all he had in his living room was a card table a chair and a typewriter that's it it hmm. was very very modest and i went he is a writer he's definitely a writer but he mm -hmm. he did accompany us and we continued on to victoria british columbia with my grandfather because that was his hometown and so he um, I have a couple pictures of with with Reinhardt um, at high tea, at the um, what is it the, the the big hotel that there is there in Victoria Island, um, but it was a very very nice visit. I enjoyed it. Um, 
there's but another memory you have that you told me about that I was so interested in uh, about a talk he gave. Yes. When he would come, he would give talks. And the very last talk that I heard him give struck a core with me. It was on the subject of love. And he went through explaining the different types of love there are and, you know, agape and the different types. But then he started to talk about unconditional love. And he explained what that was. And I will never forget that for the rest of my life because I was starting to see the conditions being placed on people. And the look on his face when he was looking at certain people at, in the hall, I mean, he was a very good speaker. He, he went up there with no notes. She just walked right up and he just, he gave his talk. Mm -hmm. And when he came down, I felt chills going up my body about how he, he presented his entire talk. Mm -hmm. um, it changed things for me. Um, not that I would say that it, I, I left the organization because of his talk. No, he really laid down the basis of what true love is and how it should be. It should be unconditional. Oh, well, uh, Reinhardt um, was speaking out of the heart mm -hmm. from experience because the love at Bethel at this circumstance that caused him to leave Bethel, a place he dearly loved. A single man is perfect for Bethel. They do, you know, somebody cleans your room and fixes your food and whatever, and he left it. But he was speaking because the love was conditional. Yeah. That's why he was speaking from his heart. It was yes. conditional because uh, these people, including Ray France and others, who were asked to leave or were disfellowshipped, um, they, they didn't do what the, follow the conditions that were right. put on them mm -hmm. to uh, remain at headquarters. So he spoke from the heart on unconditional love. I wish I had heard that. Yeah. So, yeah, so you, it really affected you all these years later. So what else happened to you right around that period of time when you turned uh, to adult adulthood? I got married. Mm. <laughs> what a lot of young people do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got how, old, how old were you? I was 18. Mm -hmm. And I'm still married to, to my same husband. Same husband. I'll That's tell you what, aren't we, me too. Aren't we gluttons for punishment? <laughs> That's an old expression. That's what my mama said. So how about, um, uh, you don't have to tell us much about your husband. Uh, you can tell us what you want, but uh, he was related to someone that. No, I'll talk about that. He was related to our district overseer and his grand, okay, I'll go, I'll, actually, let's go back to his grandfather. His grandfather um, was friends with Rutherford and he, uh, had the sound cars out there in Buffalo, and he Samuel, was, Samuel Samuel Saya Samuel Saya Saya, and there's a landmark court case from Saya versus the state of New York mm -hmm. on the sound cars. Um, uh, Rick Rick has uh, if he you know if he's true to his promises he's got a picture. <laughs> of the, uh, and I was very cars. I was very uh, honored to be part of a family that had so much um, respect for the First Amendment and the rights for all humans. And I, at that time, really felt that that meant everybody. Um, but things I found out would change. <laughs> so, there we go. There hey, we go. Sir, is possible. You, you talk, go ahead. That is Pa's car. And um, I used to see this photo when I would go over for dinner. And um, 
we were very, very proud that they, they stood for First Amendment rights. In fact, when you go to law school, this is one of the landmark cases that every law student must read. So we can be very proud That's of that. Right. Yeah, see, 47 cases at the witnesses, until 1988, I should say, okay. one are always taught, from what I know, in law school. It might be different nowadays. Who knows how things have changed, but it used to be that way. Uh, because Jehovah's Witnesses really uh, were the responsible for the freedoms of speech. Right. And this time a thing, too, and uh, and these sound cars went up and down the road blasting the message about the, the kingdom. And, yes. uh, and so there were complaints and it, it wasn't legal. Uh, there's um, about the Supreme Court. I have a page from the Supreme Court decision. At this point, it was an appeal on this. And, and it was forbidden in that area of California to uh, have a, a loudspeaker on a car. Mm -hmm. So... So your um, uh, husband's um, uh, grandfather, grandfather yeah, uh, did a great thing uh, by going to, uh, to, to take this to court. Mm -hmm. And um, there were so many others at, at the same time. This was 1948, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, um, that's what it says on the Supreme Court paper that I have. So yeah, it was an honor because you thought the organization was progressive, didn't you? Yes, very much so. And fought yeah. for the, your and, favorite word, freedom. And, mm -hmm. So, so uh, the witnesses were embracing the freedom that they had to go to the highest court of the land to, to ask or, or maybe I should say demand Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, what they desired to do, uh, it it was made uh, law. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so uh, there's another relative that uh, uh, Rick. If Rick will show us a picture <laughs> of this this other relative, are you there, Rick? We got a picture of a bride. I'll get that one right now. Give Give me one second. Okay, we'll keep talking. Okay. This is a this is a picture of Joe Saya. Many people who are older will remember him. He was a district overseer uh, in many many parts of the, the United States. Uh, the this family, the Saya family, originated in uh, upstate New York. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And so um, this picture is of a bride who happens to be talking to us today uh, not me <laughs> but and uh who's standing next to her is um a uh, jose and uh in front but you can barely see her is lucille say his wife it's so, not a screen yet. Oh, yeah. hold on a second we're just having a little difficulty getting up just give us about one second go ahead and keep talking that's mind. okay because i'm gonna tell a little story i'm i'm telling you I just love the Sayers. Yes. And let's see. There. Look. There's there Joseph. And, and oh. that is our girl, Carrie Kay, who's a bride. I just adored her. And look how she's holding my hand. Mm -hmm. We just had a bond, she and I. She's a lovely, uh, lovely woman. I and, just uh, adored I her. Tell, and, and tell you know, me. Joe was a. The, about her. I got, I'm going to get ahead of you because I want you to tell the folk about what happened to her in the field service. Yes, uh, she was out in field service with the um, with the 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 record Vic players. Right, the, the, record players, the one that you lined up. In fact, I have two of them here at the house. Oh. Um, they were given to me by one of the other brothers when I went out to visit one year, and. I have some of the records as well. I have snare and racket, but she was out in field service and somebody pushed her off the porch and it injured her to the point where she never had children. And she, yes. Was, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she told me that in private and she's passed away for so many years now. Um, 
Yes. But I want people to know that she was just a lovely, lovely woman, mm -hmm. not just a sister, but a human being. And so we Oh, she gave her all. This in the 40s, she's out there plugging along, going in the field service. She's up at the top of the stairs playing the, that was the other one that happened to her where the guy pushed her down the stairs and she was injured yeah. uh, at that one too, but didn't stop her. Uh, the Sayers were the district overseer. He was the district overseer in um, Florida when Joe and I lived in West Palm Beach where we were married. And so about six years later, uh, the Sayers um, asked us if they could park their trailer on my dad's property. My dad had an acre in West Palm Beach, in, sort of outside of the city uh, of West Palm Beach, in a little country, a part of the area. And um, so uh, Lucille had, a ha had to have an operation, and it was going to take six months for her to recover. So uh, husband Joe parked their little um, travel trailer uh, behind our, we had a trailer in the corner. We were going to go into the um, circuit work. So eventually, so we we still had the, uh, a trailer and um, we had traded the little one in once we had our son and got a bigger one. And, uh, but we were always in, full-time service we're always doing something so we didn't want to be bogged down with the house and uh so they parked right behind uh, our, our our trailer and he would go off into the district court he would be gone for the week to um sunday after the talk wherever he was he would head to west palm beach and uh, we would have a barbecue in the backyard so my mom and dad lived next door and so we had a nice time well i'll never forget lucille knocking at my door one morning and uh our the one acre was all fenced in and when our son who was at the time four years old and uh, as she uh, knocked on her door and she when i opened it she said do you know where lance is and i said yeah he's out in the yard and his grandparents were out always in and out i said well he, if he's not in their house he's out in the yard somewhere she said no 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 see my father was not a witness and okay. but he approved of it he didn't care what, what we did he was a very nice man and he had his own lived in his own world sort of so she said no no she said lance isn't over there out in the yard he's behind my trailer he's smoking four years old oh, i was a Appalled, appalled. The district overseer's wife comes to me and tells me our son is smoking behind their trailer. Oh, you couldn't have been Well, let's see, it was a cigarette butt. My father was a smoker and he threw the butt. <laughs> and, and they just picked it up and he was smoking there. I said, You couldn't be more embarrassed because, you know, the district overseers, they were special. So <laughs> embarrassed. Well, anyway. Oh, that's funny. Joe and Lucille, wonderful, wonderful people. And when I was at Bethel, uh, near the time, uh, I guess about a year or so before I left Bethel, I had a conversation with Lucille over the phone. She, they were retired and living in South Florida. No, Central Florida. And so um, we were chatting and I said, does Joe miss the district work? She said, no, he doesn't miss it at all. And I'm yeah. going to quote what she said. Okay. She said he was very tired of it all. Tired of the arguing. Mm -hmm. Tired of the elders, the way they behaved. He had enough. Of, it was a lifetime, practically, of, of uh, being involved in all of that. And he had enough. And I made this, and she specifically mentioned the elders and the brothers. And I made a remark. And I said, you know, Lucille, women who become witnesses, they fall in love uh, with, and, and I meant it because that's the way I felt about it. I said, they fall in love with Jehovah. Mm -hmm. They're dedicated to Jehovah. It's different with many of the men, many of the others. They fall in love with the organization. Mm -hmm. And she said, you are right, Barbara. I'm going to tell Joe that. That is exactly what we have observed. Now, isn't that fascinating? It's very it, fascinating. It, because but, once you you get into it like they did, they saw the reality 
that the organization, it wasn't the God thing anymore for so many people, even to this day, it's power, prestige. Right, right. So they were that, so Go ahead. So, so humble, so good, such good people. And even when we later, and we'll get, we'll talk about that later, even when we, we were fading, they never shunned us, ever. So she, loved, she loved me as much as she did before. I'll tell it you. Never changed. That's and wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I can get teary eyed about it. Yeah, we just, have memories, of good memories of good people. Um, yeah. You know, so the uh, Joe Saya did a wonderful thing uh, in our life, beside what I mentioned, any of that. Uh, we had a, a man, when Joe, my Joe, comes out of Bethel, um, the congregation in West Palm Beach divided just around that time. And so uh, the assistant congregation servant is made the congregation servant of the new congregation. And Joe's made the assistant congregation servant. And so, uh, but this man who was made congregation servant came from, I'm making this fast, but it's very important because he came from upstate New York. Uh, not that that matters, but he settled in West Palm. He was a chiropractor. Now, I have nothing against chiropractors. In fact, I was thrown from a horse at, at uh, 14 years old. So I utilized chiropractic for my back. And right. uh, so, uh, but this man was different. He was strange. And what he did was he used his Florida room, that extended room uh, most houses years ago had, with the, the windows were slats. And yeah. uh, that's where you sat in the evening and the breeze blew in, whatever, and watched TV. Well, he used that as his uh, room where he gave adjustments. And right. witnesses were coming everywhere to have an adjustment. Uh, and he, he didn't take money. He put a box up, and they put money in the box. Okay. At this, at this time, what that man Earl was doing is uh, women were very careful what they were saying. But eventually it came out. And he was a married man. And uh, he was married to a, old, a woman older than him. And he was quite up in age at that time. Uh, she must have been in her 60s. And he was way up in her 60s. And she claimed to be the anointed. He didn't. And mm -hmm. so he was uh, uh, maybe eight, ten years younger. And so uh, why he did this, who knows? And I don't care to discuss it. But he was, he was actually uh, using that to... Um, actually, he was molesting the women. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it got serious. He was yeah. kissing them. But uh, Earl may have had a reputation everywhere for being so wonderful and because he was a chiropractor and he didn't charge. Everybody loved him. And nobody wanted to listen to the accusations of the sisters. And I was one of the sisters at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but uh, well, there was nothing we could do about it. And it was Josea. Josea got a hold of people at Bethel in the service department and talked about it to them to get their attention to remove Earl from his position. Earl then turned around and wrote one of the governing body, who was a close friend of his, and said, this Joe Anderson, this whippersnapper from Bethel wants my position, so he's complaining about me. And well, that letter that letter and also another letter from someone else came back to the congregation as the society always did so that the men elder and they weren't elders at that point and uh, at that their congregation ser uh, servants were so uh so what happened with Joe when he came uh and we tried to explain i mean there's a lot of detail here and uh this man actually digitally raped some of the sisters yeah. and and so um the society didn't do anything about it joe say was one jump ahead of them he was so disgusted with it all and uh so what he did he got the telephone book and he looked up earl's name in the telephone book and uh, after earl's name it said um it was those two letters you know dd for dr divinity uh, DC, doctor, chiropractic, you know, all that. Well, Earl had that after his name. And Earl did not have a license to practice chiropractic in the state of Florida. So it was illegal what he was doing. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Sayer uh, got a hold of the service department, told him they removed Earl. They removed Earl for that and not for what was done to the women in the congregation. Right. He had and, to get them a technicality. Yeah, a yeah. technicality. Yeah. And so, you know, we were second class citizens, but we didn't think we were. We all thought that this is Jehovah's arrangement, you know. They, they curtailed up what we thought was freedom, and we weren't. We were right. obstructed from freedom. Right. We didn't have the freedom to even speak about this. And uh, there were some other things afterwards, but they never put him in a position again. So uh, this, is a, this is creepy, uh, what happened, because when his wife died, he had a return visit on his subscription expiration. And it was a young woman who was divorcing her husband and she had a little boy and he married her. And really she was a character. She had problems mentally. He married her. And uh, this man was uh, put a Christmas tree in his front window. It was a witness. And he also uh, answered the door one day and he was nude. So he was really mentally ill. Yeah. So these are the things that so many in the organization were so disappointed about. And that's why this kind of stuff and the way it was handled, sometimes they blame the victims, as mm -hmm. you know. And yes. you'll get into that in a minute because I don't want to hold this up because you have some really uh, important things that uh, you want to talk about. So, um, but the sayers were special. And if anybody yes. knew them, they knew great people. So your your um in your life, your mother in law, right? Yes. She was arrested for witnessing in front of the Catholic Church. Yes. Tell us about the toothbrush. Yes, when back in they were warned at the Stafield Service meetings, do you have your toothbrush? So she would carry her toothbrush in her book bag, uh, just in case they got arrested. And one day they did. Um, I didn't know about this story until she was close to the end of her life and she was suffering from dementia and she said, come with me, come with me. And she didn't know who I was. And she looked at me and she said, do you have your toothbrush? And so I'm like, what's this toothbrush? Um, yes, I got my toothbrush. <laughs> and she took me into her bedroom and shut the door. And later on, later on, I found out it was because she had been arrested and she in that condition thought I was her friend and she wanted to make sure I had my toothbrush with me. Oh my goodness. Those were days, huh? Those were the days different, um, different than, uh, when, uh, years later, when we went out in the uh, work, we didn't carry our, we didn't need to carry our toothbrushes <laughs> because, <laughs> because we weren't arrested because of uh, many reasons we weren't arrested is because of, of uh, the Watchtower attorneys going to the Supreme Court over freedom to go door to door. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So we can give them credit. Credit where well, credit was due, but it was done for to free up Jehovah's Witnesses and their freedoms were the thing. And so, uh, but what happened, most of America benefited from the freedoms that Jehovah's Witnesses fought for, for their own people. And then it would have turned out to be when I worked on the 30th chapter of the Proclaimers book, which is on those uh, uh, those cases, and uh, realized reading and reading, reading all of them, that um, they didn't uh, uh, apply these things to the members of the organization. And members of the organization had no freedoms. We couldn't right. talk about well, except what they said we could talk about. So everybody else got free uh, because of the uh, rules and regulations changing due to what Jehovah's Witnesses did at the Supreme Court level. So uh, it's important that people know this. And uh, uh, Covington was a uh, marvelous attorney, but look at the one before him that fought for our freedoms and Moyle and what they did to him because he complained about the the drinking and the kin, and the conditions he had to live under in Bethel under Rutherford. And so 
uh, they punished him when he complained about this. So uh, where was our freedoms? Where was the witnesses who did the work, the backbone of the organization? Where was the freedoms? Right. So, okay, now we know that um, you are, you're watching all of this. And yes. uh, yeah, so you have a, um, something tells me, you know, to talk about your uh, pioneer. Pioneering yes. partner. Okay. Um, I started pioneering. Um, and my pioneer partners, I, I would work with her a lot out in field service. Um, and um, she ended up getting pregnant out of wedlock. And I found out she was pregnant. And so I was really looking forward to her coming back so that, you know, we, we could be friends again. I shunned her. And she went to her meeting and they denied her. And she went home and shot herself in the heart. Oh. It was tragic. I was at my mother's house and I collapsed on the ground. And I was seven months pregnant. Um, I just couldn't believe it. I went to a gathering. And this is when things, you know, started to go icky. Um, I went to a gathering and they were discussing that she wasn't going to be just that she wasn't going to be um, resurrected. I got fumed. I just my I, my blood started to boil, and I just looked at them and I just walked up to them and I said, "You don't know that. You cannot read her heart." And I walked out of the gathering. I was just, I just couldn't take hearing that type of talk uh, because of somebody who was hurting so bad because of the shunning. That's right. So this is causing you uh, uh, trauma. Of yes. course, I wouldn't expect anything else. And uh, so are you still pioneering though? Right? I, I, stuck by, I, I still pioneered and then unannounced, I had two brothers at my door out of the blue wanting to discuss my personal affairs with my husband and how I took care of him as a wife. And he lost his privileges because of it. Um, I was allowed to go to pioneer school two weeks later, but every time I look at my illuminators book, it, I was, I was traumatized, but I do remember this. Every single notation I had in that book was dictated for me. They told me what to write down in my notes. It was basically, they asked the question and then they told us the answer. So they basically, it was like a, a back and forth, but they picked what we were to write in our book. Yes. And, 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 I was, oh, yeah. and I was looking at my Illuminators book the other day and I remembered that thought and I was like, wow. So I wrote in the front of my book that that's what happened so that later in life, if my children look at it, they'll understand. So um, then after that, we moved. And but what we, happened with your father? We moved congregations because we were like, we're just let's get a fresh start. So we moved congregations. My husband at that time stopped going and um then I get a phone call from my mom that my dad is going to be disfellowshipped or disassociated. And my heart sank. I was told that I should back up. This happened right before I moved. So I was told by my elders that if I, if I talked to my father, that I would expect punishment. So I knew I had to be loyal and I shunned my father for a year and a half. Why were they going to disfellowship him? For neutrality. He was, he had his job that he had ever since. He got married. <laughs> and um, it was a government job. He worked on the first GPS for, um, uh, it was funded by the government. So when they found that out and they asked him exactly what he did for a living, he says, I can't tell you. And they said, because you can't tell us what you do for a living, you have to disassociate or we'll disfellowship you. So. What um, an invasion of privacy. 
evasion. It was a complete invasion here, invasion there. It it felt it was unending. Um, so I started. Yeah. So I I continued on as best I could, but I was having conflicting feelings. My freedoms were being taken. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, how could you embrace freedom when you don't have any? You know, they tell right. you that you, you can't talk to your father. Yeah. Uh, and uh, over a year passed, but um, you woke up and uh, uh, from this, and so you were changed. And I, I really thought this was interesting. I, I find everything, all people's experiences, fascinating. Um, um, because I, I love people and when to hear what they have gone through and, and, and the claims that this is God's organization, who the heck wants God's organization when the, the people in it uh, right. are suffering? It's not all of them, that's for sure, but too many of them. And uh, so this, this situation resolved itself in an interesting way. Yes, it did. Um, first, firstly, I got a letter from my grandmother and she was not a witness. I still have that letter to this day. And I may, I may post it on my Facebook page at some point. Um, but she explained to me what a good person my father was. And I knew that and how he's sacrificed his entire life so that we could have a good life. And I knew that. And so she didn't understand how men, could tell me I couldn't talk to my own father. So I started thinking and I remembered Michael Jackson. So I also re realized that Michael had been disassociated for his Thriller album. And um, his sister was in my congregation, my new congregation. What was your name? Ruby. That's right. Very, very lovely woman, lovely woman. And I respected her. I felt that she was a she was a strong woman. You know, she she when I was in her house, I could tell. You know, this this woman's got she's she's she stands on her own two feet here. And so I respect that. I looked up to her. So I asked her how. I said, how do you handle not talking to your brother because he's disassociated? Because I'm struggling. And she looked at me and she said, like kind of like. Like, what are you saying? She said, I would never let some man tell me that I can't talk to my own brother. I was shocked. I went, I've broken my father's heart. And she's not, a, what, what are there? Are there two different rules? <laughs> I, I woke up like right then I went, I'm not having this. I'm not doing this anymore. So I went home. I called my dad. He started, he started coming around. In fact, he lived with us a couple, a few days a week for his work because they were trying to retire and move away. And we were brought, we were brought back together as a family unit again. That's and I can thank her for that. So. Thank and you. she was an active J.W. She, uh, uh, when the Thriller concert came to New York and we were at Bethel, uh, the uh, it was Reby that did uh, Michael's uh, programs. I mean, he she she would uh, be the one who uh, arranged for the concerts. She did the scheduling of mm -hmm. uh, so many things, and it we were told that many of us who were privy to hearing about that Michael at that time uh, that. Uh, she, as a JW, uh, so this was before, of course, he was disassociated, but she was an active witness as far as I knew. Uh, after, after she, she didn't leave the organization, she controlled the organization and they didn't do anything to her because of him. That's a sad thing about the organization. They were just men. Uh, just like the one that I I was walking with uh, from the service department, and when he found out that uh, I turned down working in service with Michael Jackson, uh, he couldn't get over it. He said, "I would do it. I would do it any time." And I and he said, well, uh, I, "He said, why did you why did you not work with him?" And I said, 
uh, um, Joe didn't want to. He said he had his own uh, service group to meet with. He said, why should I go to the Bronx when I got my own service here in Brooklyn and people, I was taking them out in service. And so uh, so he said, uh, uh, said some more, more things to me. And I said, oh, I wanted to be out in service because I had questions to ask him. So he said, what questions? <laughs> And I said, oh, I, I wanted to know why he kept grabbing his crotch during the program. <laughs> <his programs." laughs> and, and, and I thought, because I don't, that was it. That was morality, you know. That was indecent. And so, uh, what? He, he actually, this guy from insert, who it happens to be, I, th I believe, still president of one of the corporations now. And he told me that was the silliest thing. He didn't care that. Michael had a white glove on, was doing all that during his. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you know, it, it was it was uh, amazing, and so anyway, you have your um, memories. I have my <laughs> memories, and they kind of overlap with the same people. Yeah. yeah, we do. I think that's why I knew that when I first reached out to you many years ago, we would have some fun conversations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know, and it has been fun. It, you really, though, went through to my, uh, uh, I, I would have never thought, because you are so up all the time. I mean, you always have a smile on your face. But uh, after this business of the uh, your father, and you got back with your father, and you didn't let the organization control you anymore, uh, you, you had um, a, a life-changing uh, 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 something life changing in your world. So you started to suffer. Yes, I I started to suffer because I knew I was going to disappoint my family and friends because I was leaving, and so yeah. I started to suffer deeply from depression, and I was suffering from trauma from everything. When you realize, and were you depressed? Pardon? Were you depressed? I was very depressed, extremely depressed from it. Um, I went into therapy and the therapy really helped me. Um, but I was still, I was reliving too many things. And so they put me on antidepressants and I had a bad reaction to the antidepressants and they almost killed me. But when I almost died, when I, came back to everything I realized that life is short and you just gotta you gotta do what you want to do and I also learned from that experience that everybody's spirituality is personal and nobody ever ever should tell you how you should believe that is personal so that's yes. what I came yes. out of it and yes. um and so we fled, we, we moved towns. We thought it would be easier for our children to grow up without it, without that pressure. I wanted to break the cycle and that's what we did. How many children do you have? Three. Mm -hmm. All of, well, all, they're, they're thriving. They, they're all uh, college graduates. They're, they're out living their lives. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing and they have no hangups. Um, I really, we took the, we took the brunt of it all and they, they're doing okay. Uh, for different ones than, who leave, they have different uh, experiences. Some go through trauma, some go through uh, happiness, uh, you know, different things happen to, because we're also uh, different. Uh, when I left, I went to college. I was 58 years old. I'm saying this because I want people to hear this. If I can go to college at 58, you can go to college. Don't think right. you're too old. There were people in those college classes who were older than me. Mm -hmm. And I loved every minute of it. I loved the uh, information. I uh, loved the classes on uh, being able to uh, critically think, as we've talk I've talked with others over this in the time past. You know, uh, we learned a lot from the witnesses. Uh, you got to give credit where credit is due. Absolutely. The ministry school, the going door to door as young people or kids growing up in it, they might not like it, and some loved it, uh, but it prepared them for a future. Uh, mm -hmm. Other kids have, that are struggling who who don't know how to talk to strangers. 
Uh, we learned how to talk to strangers. And, uh, but the, the, the thing with us as kids or young people who have uh, left the organization, we, when you look back, we gained things, but we lost things. And so we lost ourselves. Yes. We, did. we lost us as people to know what we were really capable or want to do with ourselves. And for so many, it never returns. But if you're young enough, uh, you can make it. And, and uh, if, if I made it, uh, anybody can make it. And so uh, the experiences where I volunteered, I went to the uh, Red Cross, the Washer Hayser Red Cross. I've said this before, but I want so badly for those listening to know there is a life out there. There's a life after Watch Hour, and you will make something out of yourself if you believe in yourself. In the Watch Hour, you're not taught to believe in yourself. Right. You're taught to believe in the organization in Jehovah. You, the individual, doesn't count. What a right. mistake to make, and that's why they are where they are today. So you faded, your family faded, and how long, uh, tell, tell us about what you pursued after that. Um, after that, I raised my children um, and I educated myself and I read and I am an artist, I'm a photographer. I, I worked on, um, I donated a lot of my time, I volunteered um, my, my talents um, for uh, photography and also uh, film work, um, editing, um, um, and also I love to write. So that's what I love to do. But my main thing was my children, was getting my children their college education and protecting them. Um, and, uh, did you have a community or was it just your relatives and your kids? Or what happened? I did not have a community. Um, I just kept it, I kept that part of my life like pretty quiet. My husband and we had our we had our times where we talked. Um, but I didn't have a community until my son sat me down one day. He did. Your son? How old yes. was he when he was in his early twenties? Um, and I didn't know that there was a community of people like me. And he had me listen to a radio program. And on the, this radio program, there was people coming in who were ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were telling their story. And I'm crying. You know, I'm having tears come down my eyes because I'm like, oh, my God, there's really people out there. There's a lot of people. Wow, they and have the same story as me. And my son turns to me after the, the, the show was over and he said, Mom, Dad, I want to thank you for everything you sacrificed so that we can have our freedom. What oh, beautiful. I, at that moment, felt like it was all worth it. All the okay. sacrifices. Everything. Okay. What, what program did he turn you on to? It was six screens. This six program. screens? <laughs> program. This six screens, I'll tell you. And that was before we were on a video. I, I mean, you know, that was on a telephone, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so we were just listening to it from his yeah. phone. Yeah. He just sat his phone down and said, listen. Little and, did you know that it would be part of your life in the future. Yeah, and I've been I've been like um, in in the background. If I if I thought I could help out, I would chime in here and there, and then I would have to back away, you know, for you know, and, and I would come in back in again. And so I've done what I can, and then I've been there. Um, followed my intuition a lot because I know sometimes. You, you have to listen to your gut. <laughs> you know, when is, when is the proper time? When is, when is a good time to say something? When is it not a good time to say something? Um, so, and I respect Jehovah's Witnesses. I respect as far as that, that that's their belief. But um, if somebody wants to leave and, 
and move on and, and, and do something different. There's no reason why we can't commingle and still be human. And as long as, like I said before, a person's spirituality of their religion is a personal thing. You can't dictate that. It's a choice. It's personal. And um, I think that they're going to continue having problems until they realize that they have to give people their freedom back. The um, <laughs> you were, were you ever disfellowship? No, I was never disfellowship. Mm -hmm. So no. somebody, so so they could shake your hand if they were. Yeah, yeah. I get, I get, I, unless uh, I, I'm not going to be someone to say, "Oh, you're a horrible person because you're that religion." No, um, that's their choice. That's their journey. They're supposed to be learning from whatever they're doing in their life. That's none of my business. Can you imagine uh, someone telling you, like the the uh, Sanderson recently uh, in the videos that we're now looking at, telling uh, a, a few, they claim they have millions of people, and he's telling them that who they can shake a hand and who they couldn't. And now... They can't. They can shake the hands of uh, people who were disfellowshipped. So we like have like a questionnaire and like fill out the questionnaire before they can decide if we can have our hands shook. shook? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. it's just it's ridiculous. It, it's you know it's yeah. incomprehensible to people from the outside to understand that. Yes. Um, try, and when I try to explain it to people who have never been exposed, they're like. I don't get that. That just doesn't seem right. You know, because, yeah. you know, like, and I'm like, yeah, I know. It's really hard to explain, but, you know, yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it's hard to explain. <laughs> and, and I look at people who say that to me and I think, I'm so glad you didn't have to go through that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it's really bizarre. It really it is. And it's gotten worse. Look, coming from my perspective, looking back at it from being out for over twenty years, I look at the look at it all now and go, "Oh, cringe! It's even ickier." Um, I know they're doing all these changes, and you know that's that's more progressive. I I mean, um, not but much, they, though. Not much. Not much. They, they have a lot of work to do. Yeah, it, it, it is basically done yeah. for the courts. Not for the people, for the courts. So when they go in court because they're violating human rights by uh, their uh, dogma, so to speak, uh, on shunning or disfellowshipping, um, they can say, oh, no, no, we, we don't do that. We, uh, we put the hand of friendship. Remember, that's what they always said, that when you shook someone's yeah. hand, it's the hand of friendship. So we put that in that little, in that little video that they're showing. Uh, the woman walks into the kingdom hall and uh, the uh, man and a woman walk up to her with a solemn face and put a hand out to her and welcome her there. And and that is supposed to change all uh, the situation uh, that she wants to come back. And so see how good they are. They put the hand of friendship out, but you can't. Uh, oh, they also have this new thing that the elders can now visit. Uh, disfellowship people more than uh, once, so they they are allowing that because if you read more about it uh, of the different rules, it's just just not uh, uh, this particular thing on um, putting out the hand for fellowship. Uh, they they didn't even say that, you know. Welcome, uh, and then uh, they think the person is going to immediately jump back in because see they're the sinner. And they've got to uh, to um, repent of their sins. And so here, we're forgiving you. We're shaking your hand. And so come back in. But you're the one who uh, messed up. And and then, uh, but, you know, uh, we, we accept you now. If you do such and such and such and such, such, then the meetings will start with the elders. It doesn't fool anybody. It might fool uh a judge in a country in Europe where this all this is under consideration of human rights, uh, but 
even nowadays we're seeing uh, that they're not being fooled. Different countries no. are. Oh, no, they're not, no, they're not being fooled. Mm -mm. No. So, uh, so can, what are you doing? Oh, go ahead. Keep going. Oh, I was just going to, I was just going to say that they're a lot smarter than where these people um, are coming from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, desperation is causing the watchtower uh, to do these strange things and making out like it's so important. Um, you know, this business of women wearing pants. You think of all the years that the women had to be at these big conventions with a mob of kids, and you, which you went through, and then you had this dress on, and uh, but your husband, you know, he has the pants, but uh, he's so busy listening because he's an elder, and the women are struggling. And they have to look gloriously beautiful, and so now they can. Uh, they can. It's like a. Um, let's turn back the clock and take a reality look at what you did for to us all. And so uh, it doesn't work. It's not going to work. In fact, they don't have eight day conventions anymore. Anyway, they have if they have if they got one day, that's a lot. So. Yes. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier to live, and now they make it easier to to even <laughs> match your clothes. Uh, I found it uh, funny about Carl Klein when he he would uh, never allow his wife to wear pants, never. Even when they were going shopping, he just thought that was the worst, god awfulest thing for a woman to wear slacks. And mm -hmm. uh, I was told that the day after he died, after the funeral. Uh, she went out and bought herself a pantsuit. <laughs> oh, good for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she got him. She got him back. And yeah. uh, if it's a godly thing, uh, who are you fooling? You know, yeah. it's this whole oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think God really cares about our clothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Uh, they sure cared about the, the organization. Sure cared about it. How, and now the men don't have to even wear a tie. That isn't that is something. Down on um, uh, avoidjw.org. There's a writer who's on Reddit and put out a huge article on all this. And this individual is doing the writing. Uh, uh, put down all the other issues and and very very well done. So um, it talks about the, the men don't have to wear, they don't have to wear, wear the um, jacket and all the, just a nice, nice clean clothes. You know, um, uh, dress is subjective and beards are subjective. Some people think a, a beard that is um, a long down to your waist is okay. And other people think it's awful. So in the organization, now they can have beards. But what kind of beard can they have? Are you going to counsel someone who's got a beard that is, um, and I saw one of the witnesses, and uh, the whole here, all this was clean, clean shaven off, and all here was a beard going down. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, that's weird beard. <laughs> but that's, is that going to please the elders? They're going to get into beard arguments. <laughs> so, <laughs> they are. Why <laughs> <laughs> on the wall nowadays? It's just with all these changes. It's interesting. Just yeah, interesting. To look at it. And we're not making fun. You know, they, they're sincere. But they're also putting upon other people things that don't belong there. This is like yeah. you have uh, expressed yourself about personal. I don't know. So what are you doing nowadays? What am I doing nowadays? I'm, uh, I am writing a novel. Okay. Give us um, an idea I'm, what it's about. Oh, you want to hear what it's about? Yeah. It's a little um, bit. A little, so little, we don't give a little bit because I got to keep a lot of it under wraps. Because Absolutely. Of mm -hmm. But it is based off of a true story about my third great grandmother and her heroic trip of um, coming to the West Coast during the Civil War and how she helped a group of women be empowered. And that's basically what it's about. So I have her personal journal and um, I'm expanding on it and 
I got the okay from my grandmother before she passed away to go ahead and, and develop it. So, oh, okay. And I'll tell you, when I'm reading her work, I see a lot of myself in her. And I see a lot of the things that they were going through as women and um, during that time because they couldn't vote. Um, and the same the same issues are are going are going on with women's liberation and being treated equally so it's going to have a and and also you know they had banning of books and they so they had all this, these interesting things that we're still facing today absolutely so, yeah. i i uh, in my research uh the 19th century I was uh, I was really surprised there were so many women's issues were off, uh, to the forefront, and uh, women were really um, speaking out. You know, the only jobs some women had were um, uh, governess, and uh, not even off men hold held all the office positions, mm -hmm. and they were the ones who did the shorthand. And, you know, yeah. things changed uh, over the years, but that was and as. And one I think I found so interesting was that school teachers, once you married in the here, here in many of the states in the United States, uh, you couldn't teach school. It was only uh, single women, married the, men, but not uh, not married women were not permitted to teach specifically here on uh, in the or in the uh, East Coast. I don't know. I didn't investigate out in California. I don't know if this was a, a, a federal in what, thing. In what years? Um, I'd say, um, well, like 18, in the 1860s, after the uh, Civil yeah. War continued, yeah. 1865, at the end of the Civil War, after that, it was still intact. And, yeah. the, and the problems were with marriage because mm -hmm. um, uh, you, there were a number of different kinds of marriage that you could choose. They they wouldn't uh, permit uh, a um, certain kind of divorces even because uh, if a woman didn't get any alimony, how is she going to support herself? So so you couldn't marry if you uh, took alimony. So you had to, to get money to, to raise your kids if you had a husband that beat you. Uh, and you accepted alimony, you couldn't marry. Right. So, so the intrusion on people's personal lives, if you studied every state in, in the United States, you're going to find different, different rules and regulations. But women have always had problems. Are we, you and me, women slid? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, they can get out of uh, proportion too. But generally right. speaking, we do have a lot. Of, we have the freedoms we should have had all those many years and religion yes. was responsible for uh uh the whole to keep the women down because of eve yes yes mm -hmm. yes That's so, so you're uh, you're writing your novel and uh, I'm, an artist. I'm an artist um so i i saw my work and i um i volunteer my time to a couple art associations and um so, and I'm getting involved with some other groups of people for human rights. So, human rights. Good, yeah. good, good. That's yeah. my whole thing on human rights. I don't care what people do in their personal life if they don't harm, you know, yeah. but if they, they, that's their business. But I'm they big, have rights. Yeah, I'm a big believer in equality. And mm -hmm. I think it, it, it ran in the family. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> so, yes, certainly did. Well, we will, we will uh, certainly look forward to the book when it comes out. Thank you. Um, you know, um, we all belong to the human family, and um, the human family doesn't look too good right now. <laughs> you know, There's it's got a lot of a lot of issues. Well, um, we all we all have things that we can contribute to make things better and if we look at ourselves in the mirror and we try to be that type of person we can encourage other people to be the same and that's what we can do and if we're in positions and those people who are educating themselves coming out um hint hint um you can make yourself available for um 
different different ways where you can help your communities. So there's that. That's right. The nicest and finest people are volunteers. Now, I'm sure there's an exception to the rule, but I found um, people who are givers of themselves to help others uh, are very fine people. And it begins the um, friendships, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and people, they start caring. Uh, I know people who, uh, who were witnesses who reached out and, and um, took the sick, people who are who are ill with cancer and they're under chemotherapy and they uh, people volunteer to drive them to the facility because right. they can't do it themselves and they make fine friends i talked about this before i'll keep talking about the same old thing because i want people to have be happy and you'll be happy if you give of yourselves it is a, a natural thing uh, humans uh are noticeably happy when they <laughs> when they find themselves involved in um, uh, showing love to others as they love themselves. Isn't that a familiar? That's person? very familiar. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Of all the things I hear, I mean, all of this has been so interesting chatting with you, and uh, your um, you sacrificed a lot, and I loved what your son said. And I think yeah. we should conclude our discussion because you embrace freedom and yes. true freedom and uh, and you're happy and you do it in your way and others can do it their way. But you but you did something for your family. And your son put it in beautiful words. Yes. Yeah, he said. Oh, um, I I did say that before, but he I don't did care. just say you know, let's say it again. Say when it again. He down, he said, "Thank you, mom, for the sacrifice. You all the sacrifices so that we could have our freedom." Yes, that's yes. so important. That's right. And I know I have never interfered with my children's ideas and where they want to go with religion or politics or or their education um i gave them i i walked them into the library one day and i said you know what the best thing on this planet is and they said what mom i said knowledge here is a full library start reading exactly and yeah. and um i went over to uh reddit uh i i'm I want to say I don't do that often, though I uh, posted twice, I think, on there in, in all these years. But um, what really uh, I have to say what was upsetting was the young people, teenagers, who were posting on there uh, about their lives. And I'll tell you, they sound suicidal. 14-year-olds, uh, children, and because they're forced to be a witness right and just just like a richard thrift who we interviewed a few weeks ago uh and he's from originally from england but he talked about his father and whenever he asked questions about the religion his father would hit him yeah and he boxed his ears in he had black eyes you know um these kids want to be free and they can't and they're miserable and so all we can do is say, wait it out, wait it out till you're 18. Yeah. And they don't want to do anything bad. They just want the freedom that they see other kids have. Yeah. You even need freedom to make mistakes. Yes. That's how you learn. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I uh, thank you very much. And if Rick is out there, unless you have more you want to say, it's uh, I've run <laughs> out. I can't think of another thing. <laughs> <laughs> we we have done we've done well um on the children be patient with yourselves and there will be a time where you're going to have those choices to make so take the the situations that they're in and realize that they you're going to rise above it someday so you can't control your circumstances now but you will in the future. 
and you can take all the experiences that you have and you can use it for good. Even if it was bad, you can take that experience. You could be a mentor. You could help teach others. You could be teachers. You could be scientists. You could be nurses, doctors. You could be you could be lawyers, good lawyers. <laughs> you could be anything you want. So take the situation you're in and try to glean from it the good. The bad will be there. But at, when you turn 18 years old, you will be able to make your own decision. So plan for it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, enjoy the good at that time. I mean, there are some yeah. nice people. In, there are plenty of nice people who are Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. They subscribe to uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the freedoms not being embraced. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're okay with it. And, yeah. and we're okay with letting them, if that's what you want. But, you know, it's just as long as the, 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 uh, they ref, uh, religion doesn't harm people. But that's subjective, too. Uh, what what is harm and yeah. um, but uh, we, there's nothing you can do when you're a kid and you're waiting till you're 18 years old so they can make the best of it get themselves a little job delivering uh, telephone books or something and yeah. uh, you know make a little money and my husband when he was a kid uh, he was he made money as a as a youngster and mm -hmm. uh, so the, the kids can do this. They don't have to sit home and, and, and cry about the, that they can't uh, escape from the witnesses. Um, you know, we can talk to the purple about this. Yeah, I took the, the knowledge that, that I learned from that time, and I've used it to benefit myself now. So, yeah, yeah so I just built on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And... And it's been good for me, and I'm a happy person now. I wasn't happy at, at some. I will be honest. I've had my dark night of the soul, but they are their they are their own hero in the story. And so I, I kind of like liken it to Star Wars. You know, um, if they're waking up, they're answering that call, and they're moving forward. And um, and and what happens to to Luke? He becomes a Jedi Knight, and he gets his lightsaber and. And later on, as he's learning from the master, he he learns how to use the lightsaber. And as he progresses on, he uses a lightsaber. And it's symbolic of cutting off the bad and becoming somebody new. So as you age and you grow, those things will happen. And be the hero of your own story. So that's all I have. Uh, that's <laughs> profound advice to the next generation popping up. And yeah. Move it on. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you have embraced freedom. Our theme here, it's well put. And uh, now we're going to embrace a uh, another freedom, and that is a freedom to listen to Rick Ferrin. Well, hold on one second. Well, hold on one second. When we like to, let's just open up the lines. We always like to uh, at least have the audience, if they have any questions for Carrie. We would love to have the audience speak up. You can see the telephone number right there on YouTube and Facebook. So let's give them a second and for the, so they can respond on the telephone line. They've been listening in to Carrie. She presents herself well. Uh, I have to tell you, Carrie, I've seen some of your pictures on Facebook. You're a very, very talented woman. Uh, you. I'm into I'm into the my, my family is very talented as well in the arts. I'm, I'm in the sign business myself, designing signs and what have you. But uh, your pictures, in fact, uh, the ones of flowers, I see those on there a lot on Facebook. Uh, Meunier, is that his name, the French artist? Who mm -hmm. does? Yeah, Meunier, he does the, in fact, your pictures remind me of his. They, they really, you. really do. I mean, you really have, uh, you put the right colors in there. Everything is in proportion. You do a really, really good job. Uh, now, if you would like to speak up to Carrie, she's on with us right now. Go ahead and hit star six on your telephone pad, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have you say hello to Carrie. Let her let her know. I mean, is she a friend on Facebook? She uh, she posts a lot on there. She does wonderful artwork. She's writing a book right now. Uh, where, where'd you get all this creativity, uh, Carrie? Was that from your father, your mother? Where'd that come from? 
Um, my mother is an artist. My grandmother was an artist. Um, we have um, talented people in the family. But I also, okay, here's another a good thing for um, my art teacher was a witness and I took private lessons from her, but she also was involved in the art association. Um, but I would um, attribute, for her. Um, and she, she was a witness. She is, and um, I attribute a lot of um, my color theory to her. So, well, well you, can usually, you can usually trace it back. Uh and and find uh, who in the family had it and you kind of inherited oh, yes. yeah, yeah it's a yeah we, yeah my grandmother was very um supportive she used to take me just to, to meet different artists in the in our area and um i in fact i have a picture over here she painted this picture here it's a portrait probably right. of probably of one of the family members that from her idea she didn't finish the portrait but i keep it there as but her but her um her talent on portrait was getting really good um and that's only the one that i have um of her portrait work it is that um, is that her, that's her portrait work right there no i can see it i yeah. put it on large screen yeah right here, right here. yeah very very right. good my goodness well very yeah. talented very talented lady my goodness uh the other thing now i just wanted to ask you years ago i think you came into the six screens mm -hmm. and uh we were, were you at one time involved with Benet Brith? Who? Uh it's it's called Benet Brith. Maybe I have you mixed up with someone else that was coming no. in. It's no, a it's a, it's, she, it's an odd it's an oddball religion, like 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 the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's a cult. Yeah, uh, it's it's Jewish, isn't it? Benet Brith. Uh I'm, I'm I think so. I'm not sure, but uh, it was there was one woman, she kind of looked like you, and she came on one of our programs once. And she said that she was uh, involved with uh, B'nai B'rith, but I just yeah. thought that yeah, it's, a, it's a club um, um, sort of thing. Oh. Yeah, not, I don't have it right before me, but uh, again, they, they they use mind control tactics and people get um. all messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, anyways, uh, where is everybody here tonight? Uh, we want to say hello to Carrie. Go ahead, speak up right now. Go ahead, you're on with us. Uh, go ahead, Yaron. Go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, this is uh, Stefan. Hi, Gary. Uh, when you mentioned uh, going to the same hall um, as one of the Jacksons, I just wanted to, because I was at the same, at the same hall as the Jacksons, the mom and the oldest sister, which was Ravy. This would have been okay. back in the 80s, maybe the early 90s. Do you recall the Fleming family or the Gray family or the Maldonado family? Fleming sounds familiar. But that was that could have been Simi Valley. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yes. I think that I think that um, Michael's mom was in Encino. Um, but when I was in the congregation, it was over in the Westlake area with Ruby. Okay, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to. I was there too, and uh, um, I looked at your face. You didn't look familiar. I just thought I'd throw a few names out there at you. Okay, okay. Great. I really enjoyed your interview, by the way. Was Fleming? Oh, I think. Yes. Uh, I want to know if Fleming was an elder. I'm not sure. Fleming. I, I recall the name, but Fleming. it's been, it, it it could it's so many years ago. You know, like oh, the Fleming family or the Rodriguez family. Um, you remember people's names, you know, because you hear things. So it Fleming sounds familiar, but I can't pinpoint a face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, not a problem. That's okay. Thanks anyway, and I enjoyed your interview. Thank you. Hello? Uh, go ahead, you're on the six screens. Go ahead, say hello to Carrie. Hey, Carrie. My Hi. name's Jeff Moore, and I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed listening to your story. And uh, I did want to compliment you on your artwork. Hey, Carrie. And it, it must wait. Is somebody else on? Uh, no. I was, hold on. One okay. Second. I, we have someone. Oh, hold on one second. I'm just going to mute the person here. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Carrie. Debbie, go ahead. You're on. Okay. And I just was so thrilled for you when you said all three of your kids had graduated college. I think mm -hmm. that is absolutely 
fantastic, and you should be, and I know you are so happy and so proud of your kids. I think that is an accomplishment so many of us wish we had been able to do with our kids or even ourselves. I wish I had been able to pursue a career in medicine, but that passed me by too. And I was surprised to hear you, uh, Barbara, that you said that you you went back to college at 58. I think that's great too. I would love to do that. And I thought about doing it online. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you that I, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and I loved your, your experiences and I just thought that you had a fascinating life. Yeah, she so, did. Uh, we way, benefited uh, from her her experiences. Yeah. Uh, and, and Rick, uh, Barbara's right. Benet Barrett is Jewish um, because way back, way, way, way back in the 80s and 70s, my dad was an accountant for them and they had a nursing home that he did a lot of work for uh, oh. with the accounting business. Well, this is later on I'm doing yard maintenance and service with that. Anyway, I just wanted to let y'all know I thoroughly enjoyed the program. And we are friends on, on Facebook, Carrie. And we I do do stuff sometimes messenger. But uh, this is my first time to actually be able to meet you and see who you really are. You know, because sometimes we've got Facebook friends that we really don't know. Yeah, you got new friends now. Right. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Okie dokie. Oh, I found. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Debbie. We've got uh, we've got six three zero. Looks like Chicago. Did you want to come on six three zero? Uh, go ahead, come on back on with us if you like. Uh, Carrie K. She's on here with us. She's Barbara's guest on the program tonight. And boy, I have to tell you, really, uh, let's go with the six one four. Go ahead, six one four. Say hello to Carrie. Hi, Carrie. I got bits and pieces of your show. One one part of the show that fascinated me was. When your fa- you called your father back after summoning for a while, what was that reunion like? Uh, when was was it tears? Was it you know? Explain that to me. It was amazing, um, very heartfelt, um, it, and we just went right back into our relationship the way it was. So I knew he forgave oh. me, and I also knew he understood what kind of position I was put in. Mm-hmm. And were you pregnant at the time when all that happened? Yeah, um, I'm I'm thinking back. Um, yes, I had, and I had just had my second child. And when okay, and now here's here's the here's the clincher. I didn't even tell Barbara this. When he came back into my life, he was he was in the delivery room for my third child to be born, and I oh. asked him to be. Oh, wonderful. Oh. Yeah. What a great story. Mm-hmm. And then did he remain a, a witness the rest of his life? Your um, father? I don't want to get into details um, because that is not my story to tell. Um, but he's a very wonderful man. And he does what he needs to do. And, um, and I know he... he that's not for me to speak on. Mm-hmm. No, okay, no problem. And, and yeah. how about yourself? What how, did you did you find another faith, or how did how did all that come about? Did you just leave the organization? I just left. I just left and and just read books, and I just let my um I just let my intuition guide me, and I'm still on my journey. So. And like I was explain, explaining before, I really can't identify myself with any particular faith or religion because it's constantly changing. Because mm-hmm. um, we change. Well, yeah, and I think that's the point. I think that we are here, we're, we're creatures of learning and, and experiencing. And um, I think that that journey is tailored to the individual. and nobody's journeys are going to be exactly alike. So um, 
I take everybody at face value and I would, I don't condemn anybody for being this or that. Um, and I don't look down on people for, for believing a certain way because that's where they're at and it changes. So that's what, you know, that's what I have to say. So you, I really, I really, it, it, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, uh, did you feel any animosity when you left? Were you, were you angry at God or did you even, do you still believe in God? That's a good point. I, um, oh, that's a, that, that's a good question. Um, when I had my face with death, so to speak, um, let's just say all my anger and bitterness went away. I was no longer angry, no wow. longer bitter. Uh, for me, it was eye opening because I realized I needed to live my best life now. And from that point, everything came from the heart, my heart center. Mm -hmm. And um, how, I, how I would um, describe that, um, some people will put a, a title on, on that, on, as like a you know, believing in a belief in in God, or they want to put a title on it. Um, for me, it's just personal. <laughs> it's like <laughs> being in nature. Yeah, um, having a converse. I kind of look at like if if prayer, prayer is an inner dialogue to me. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's basically what it, it's, and it's personal. It's everybody will um, discover where they're at on their journey when, and um, I, and uh, be shown things when, when they are shown things. Mm -hmm. um, and then they will interpret that, um, which is <clears throat> them at that moment. If a, if a Jehovah's Witness knocked at your door, how, how would you handle that situation? I had that happen to me a couple, um, about four months ago, I had a lovely, lovely conversation with the two sisters. We talked for about a half an hour. And um, they were very pleasant to me, and I was very pleasant to them. And I think they respected my position, and um, and I respected theirs. And um, if I had a discussion with another Jehovah's Witness today, I think I would like it to be the same way. I would like it to leave on a positive note. Um, because I look at, I, I, because I was in their shoes at one time too, I was a regular pioneer and, um, mm -hmm. I wanted people to be nice to me. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> and that is where, and as I've gotten older, I have realized that that's where they need to be at that moment trying to be something yeah. different than you actually are at that moment isn't the way it should be because they're supposed to learn what they need to learn at that particular time. It's just like going to school. You learn a certain subject at a certain time at a certain period of your life. And everybody is learning something different at a different time. And then what you, what do you do? You take that knowledge and you place it into action. And that action should be for the benefit of humanity as a whole. And that's what I really feel deep down. Mm -hmm. and, and your husband, is he the same way? Yeah, he is too. I hope I'm yeah. not asking too many questions. Yeah. I, can, I can answer that. He, we have a lot of like uh, philosophical type uh, discussions about, about just life and um, nature and, and, and things and, um, and, we just we try to like live our life as good as human beings as we possibly can and enjoy our families while we have them and those that are telling us they're really missing out <laughs> <laughs> I, I could sit here and talk to you all night i got about 20 more questions but i know there's other people who want to talk but uh it was very nice to listen to you and uh i, I enjoyed it i enjoyed the conversation thank you thank you just be patient. Some people wake up and they they just got to learn their lessons in life. That's all.
Well, I mean, you answered those questions really good, uh, Carrie. Uh, you handled yourself well when asked somewhat tough questions. You, uh, well, being a Jehovah's Witness, I think we all were trained, right? Maybe in the ministry school, going door to door, we were, we were taught how to kind of handle ourselves. Well, you did a great job tonight, Carrie. You really, really did. And we really appreciate Barbara having you on. Uh, Barbara is always doing a good job. She does her homework, getting really good people to come on the program. So, Barbara, I want to thank you, too, for getting Carrie on here tonight. I think that was wonderful. Oh, you're it. welcome. I enjoyed it. And um, I know that um, many people are in between in belief. And many of them, uh, they neither accept or reject the idea of God. So mm -hmm. they just don't think about it. And that's yeah. um, and, and that is uh, helpful at the stage that they're in life. So um, that's the way it is, you know. Some people are just uh, very overactive in religion at some point in their life. And uh, we go through these changes, just as she said. And I appreciated talking with Carrie beforehand, too. Uh, we chatted about a lot of things. Uh, so we learn from one another. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Take care. Yeah, we're trying. Well, we'll cut you guys loose. And we appreciate uh, the callers calling in as well. The people also commenting on on Facebook and YouTube. We're on about seven to 10 different platforms here today. We appreciate it. And Carrie, keep waving that flag of victory. Don't you ever give in, up or out, and continue with your artwork. Continue thank with your you. artwork. I think that's wonderful. Barbara, thank you. You continue with your work too. Barbara's got a lot of things going too. You just keep it up, Barbara. You're doing a great job as well. So oh, thank you. You too, Rick. You so keep it up. We're going to cut thank you guys you, loose. We're going to cut you guys loose and the program here, but we got more coming up on the six screens. Don't go anywhere. We have got JW World News up next, right here on the six screens. Tell the network. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Barbara. There they go. Well, anyways, stay with us. We've got a number of programs still coming up, as we say. JW World next, World News next. And then Awakening after the Watchtower. Did you hear that program? Well, that's our good friend, Eric, out of Tennessee. He's got a program, and he'll be up to about 1 o'clock tomorrow morning talking all about what goes on behind the curtains of the Watchtower. So stay with us. I'm going to end the program here, and we're going to start our new program. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight on Barbara's program, uh, Barbara Anderson Tells All. Thank you. <laughs>